John chapter 6, John chapter 6, and we're going to start reading in verse 59, John chapter 6 in verse 59. Thank you, Travis, for that song. So it clearly lays out uh, the gospel message, what God did 2,000 years ago. Well, it's been a, a couple of weeks since we've been in John, so let me just bring us up to speed of where we were. John chapter 6 begins in a very exciting way, and Jesus is drawing tremendous crowds at this point in his ministry. So much so that he sits down on a hillside and later on the text tells us that he feeds 5,000 men. So we're assuming for that perhaps 10 to 12,000 people in total. Massive crowds are following Jesus. But after the crowds start following Jesus, he disperses. And you remember toward the end, he slips away because in chapter 6, verse 15, it says, Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew himself to the mountain. So they could not make him what he already was. He already was king. But the kingdom they wanted is a kingdom where he would provide this perpetual bread. And he understood that they were just after him for the bread, as we read a minute ago in verse 26. And so he withdrew. His disciples then uh, get on a boat. They evidently have some arrangement where they know they're going to meet Jesus on the other side. And so he comes to them, remember, at night and he walks on the water and they finally receive him. And then he gets back and reorients himself with the crowd back again. And that's where the rest of the chapter takes place. So verse 22, all the way down through the end of verse 71, Jesus is teaching. And where we pick up in verse 59, here's what it tells us. This is John 6, 59. Jesus said these things in the synagogue. He taught at Capernaum. Now, let's keep reading, and we'll read the context and the setting for Jesus' teaching. Verse 60, when many of his disciples heard it, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Now, the word translated hard saying in verse 60 just means harsh. Jesus, we love the fact that you were dispensing bread, That was wonderful, but now there's a little bit of bait and switch, Jesus. We came to follow you for this great bread, but now you're being too harsh. Why are you being so hard on us, stringent, strident? Now, why were they, why was they complaining about Jesus being so hard? And then it says, interesting, that they grumbled. Now, that's interesting because the whole context of this is the manna. Remember Jesus saying, Moses gave the manna from heaven, uh, and I am the bread of life. And the reason why they got manna in heaven is because they were humbled and they were hungry and they began to grumble at God. Remember the Old Testament, the Israelites. And so they grumbled and so God gave them bread from heaven but now they are grumbling because the true bread of life is here and they don't want that either. They're they're grumbling, they're complaining. And because of that, Jesus says they're offended. So again, setting up the context for this text, what were they so offended about? Well, the answer is back in verse 53. Look at verse 53, still setting up the context. Verse 53, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have, there is no life in you. And what did that mean? Well, our minds immediately go to uh, the Last Supper, right? After all, the context of this is Passover. But the last Passover Jesus is going to take, this is the next to the last, the last Passover, that's when he'll institute the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper, what we celebrated two weeks ago in communion, but that hasn't happened yet. John had experienced this, of course he's writing it after the fact, but the reality is no one listening to Jesus said that would be thinking the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. Now why were they so offended? Well, this really wasn't about eating flesh and drinking blood. That was a metaphor, right, for what Jesus was going to do for them. What they were offended about is the reality of the cross. That Jesus is going to die on the cross and that the only way you would have access to God is through Jesus. Our life through his death. They were offended at that. Now, (laughs) there are so many things to be offended about in the Bible. I mean, so many things. Um... I don't, I don't even know where to begin. In fact, I started to make a list. I did in my notes about all the different ways in every book of the New Testament that offends us, but it got a little exhausting. But, uh, I mean, in so many ways, God offends us. I mean, just 
turn a few pages, you're going to read in Matthew chapter 5 at the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus does not withdraw the sexual ethic from the Old Testament. He sustains it. In fact, he raises it. Their sexual ethic says that divorce was okay some of the time. Jesus says it's, um, divorce is, is something that God hates. He affirms that. And Jesus says, you've taken tremendous liberties with your sexuality. Jesus said, I say, if you even lust in your heart, that's sin. And then you give the Romans, and it's very, very clear from the book of Romans that any sexual expression outside of a man and a woman in a married union for life is outside of God's design. It's wrong. It's sinful. That is offensive today in profound ways. You understand where we are in our culture, just reading the Bible is offensive to the point that it may be a crime one day. That seems strange to seem 20 years ago, but now it seems perfectly clear. Then you get into Ephesians and we're offended even further because the marriage standard for a man and a woman is so profoundly high. And the book of Romans is offensive because it tells us that we can't come to God any other way except for Jesus Christ. And in fact, in John chapter 14, Jesus said something profoundly offensive, that God is accessible only exclusively for the person of Jesus. And so if you have a multi-faith bent, all faiths are going to somehow kind of get to God, Jesus just bluntly, directly dismantles that. There's one God, that God is accessed through one Son, Jesus Christ, alone. But of all the things that offend us in the Bible, of all the things that offend me, there's nothing more offensive than what we're going to read here today in John chapter 6. Because Jesus says that the only way you can have life beyond this life is that you're saved through the blood of a 33-year-old Jewish peasant who hung naked between two thieves. No one can be saved unless they humble themselves before the cross. And this was the offense. We think of the Gospel of John, we think of principally of John chapter 3 and verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. It hits the driving theme of John, of course, back to John 20, 31, that we should believe in him. So the book of John is a great call to believe because Jesus Christ came and he gave his life for us. And it's in that gift of his life that we can believe. But Jesus is teaching here in John 6, verses 60 through 71, toward the end, is that when we believe in Jesus because of his great gift for us, that the Holy Spirit and the Father are also giving something. They're also operative in this, that the Father, Son, and the Spirit are also moving. And so again, here's the context, verses 60 and 61. The people are offended at the teaching of Jesus, and he clarifies for them why they are offended, and he clarifies for them why they're offended by teaching them how the Spirit and the Father are operative in salvation. So, you're offended. Jesus has two teachings for them. Here's the first one. You first need to understand, Jesus explains to them, that it's the Spirit who gives life. You're offended at the cross Jesus teaches them two things. If you're taking notes, write this first one down, that the Spirit gives life. So, verse 61 again, but Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? Now let's stop there. What is Jesus talking about? Well, he's talking about his ascension. Jesus came down to earth, lived a sinless life, died on a cross, rose again, and then John doesn't include the story, but it's there at Luke chapter 24. He ascended back up to his father. Now, there are lots of people that claim to come down from God, but Jesus is unique because he came down and went back up. This is where he is now. He's at the right hand of the father. Hebrews 8 tells us and Romans 7 tells us, and he is praying for us, interceding for us is what Jesus is doing right now. So he rose back to be coronated king. Now, the significance of him rising back to his father and coordinated king, go back to chapter 6 and verse 15. Let's read this quickly. I mentioned it earlier. It says, perceiving then that they were about to come and make, take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew himself to the mountain. Why did they want to make him king? Well, because they were getting this, this free bread. And um, I've had good bread. There's nothing like fresh baked bread, but this is bread that was made by God. Bread that didn't exist before Jesus created it. It had to be the best bread they've ever eaten. And they had to be thinking if Jesus can do this on a whim at the last minute just to feed us on the fly. Imagine what he could do if he was ruling over us. 
And so then Jesus turns to him and says, look, essentially you want to make me king, but what if I go back to the Father physically, I'm over here, and the supply chain is cut off? Then Jesus says, look at verse 63, even if I were to go back to my Father, even if I'm physically not here, he says, it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. And Jesus says, physically, I don't need to be here, and it's for two reasons. Because the Holy Spirit is the one who gives you life. So this is what we call the doctrine of regeneration. When someone believes, the Holy Spirit comes with inside of them and makes them new, gives them new life. This is what Jesus was teaching Nicodemus in John chapter 3 when He says that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. So from our perspective, we hear the gospel message. We respond to the gospel message. We believe and we're saved. What we cannot see as invisible as the wind, but as real as the wind, is that when someone comes to faith in Christ, it is the Holy Spirit that goes in and quickens their heart and gives them life. And we could not be believers unless we are given the gift of life from the Holy Spirit. Now, we might be offended at the fact that you can do absolutely nothing to save yourself. We can only be saved, not from ourselves, but from the precious blood of Jesus that saved us. And Jesus is emphasizing here that our inability to be saved and God's work in bringing us to salvation from beginning to end, that it's all of him, is not just the work of the Son, but it's the work of the Spirit. No one is saved unless the Spirit gives life. This is why Romans 8, 9 says, those that do not have the Spirit are none of his. We grow in our filling of the Spirit, but no one is a believer and then later receives the Spirit. To be a believer is to have the Spirit. Why? Well, because the Spirit gives us life. You can't can't be saved unless you're quickened by the Holy Spirit. So look at what else Jesus says, and there it is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I've spoken to you are spirit and life. That's an interesting phrase. It says, the flesh is no help at all. That's so contrary to the way we think, isn't it? We love our flesh. We coddle our flesh. We pamper our flesh. We take care of our flesh. We give our flesh breaks. We rest our flesh. We fix up our flesh. On Sunday usually is the best our flesh gets throughout the week. We'll beach our flesh this summer so that we can tan our flesh. We try to reduce our flesh and enhance our flesh. We love to take care of all the things about our flesh. My dad used to joke about the lady who had so many facelifts that when she sat down, her mouth would fly open. That's, that's funny, like an old preachery joke kind of way. So if you grew up Baptist, you think that's funny, okay? If you don't, I understand. That's funny. We, we love to take care of our flesh. Jesus says, though, contrary to the way we think, the flesh is no help at all. Now he's not talking about his own flesh because after all, Romans John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us so Jesus had to come in the flesh. How is the flesh no help? The flesh is no help in getting us eternal life. The most brilliant person in this room cannot access God, cannot think their way to God. The most righteous person in Little Rock cannot behave their way toward God. The most talented person in the world cannot move themselves any closer to God. The person who has nothing and the person who has everything in the eyes of this world is the same before God. The flesh is of no value at all. And this is why, while it's not impossible, it's difficult for people consumed with the flesh to find God because they have to come to an awakening of their complete inability and God's complete ability to save them. And so when Jesus taught, he didn't appeal to the flesh. What did he do? Well, look at what he says. It's the Spirit who gives life, the flesh no help at all, the words that I've spoken to your spirit in life. He he gave them the words that were the true bread of life. Not the physical bread, but the bread of life. And so Jesus is saying is, look, there's a reason why you can't 
understand this. There's a reason why you're offended. And it's the first thing is, is that you don't understand that it is the spirit that gives life. And if you're after me for what I can give to you, you're going to be perpetually disappointed because I'm not going to constantly appeal to your flesh. I'm giving you something spirit. And that spirit that is inside of you when Jesus saves you and regenerates you lasts for all eternity. It's the eternal bread that never goes away. So Jesus says, don't be after bread. Be after the bread of life. In the same way he told Nicodemus, you were born, but now you can be born again. The one with the well, you have water. You need to have living water. Jesus is pressing that same metaphor and saying, you have physical bread, but you need the true bread of life. And that true bread of life is me, and I'm giving you the words of life infused with the Spirit of God that can allow you to be saved. Come to faith in Christ. Jesus is not trying to help them get over their offensiveness. (laughs) He's not making it any better. He's just explaining them why they're offended to begin with. You're offended because you have to come to me for salvation. You have to find life in my death. But I want to explain to you that that's because I have to give you new life and it is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, who gives that life. So why are they offended? Well, because they don't understand that the Spirit gives life, but they also don't understand, secondly, that it is the Father who gives faith. So here Jesus explains it more. Look at verse 64. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus, John says parenthetically, knew from the beginning who those were who did not believe and who it was that would betray him. And he said, this is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by the Father. That's a very, very heavy verse. No one can come to him unless it is granted by the Father. That's, that's scary. What does that mean? Well, three things that I want you to put inside your mind. In fact, you might jot this down next to this verse in the back of your Bible somewhere that'll help. And this is all unpacked in this story, three truths that help us understand what Jesus is saying there. And the first thing is, is that whosoever will uh, may come. This is the whole point of the chapter begins. Jesus is teaching to 5,000 people, 10,000 people, 12,000 people. He's preaching this huge crowd and the giving of the bread was a call to believe. The word believe mentioned over 100 times in John. This whole book is a call to believe, to believe, to believe. Stop not believing and choose to believe. Believe. But not all people are going to believe. So the second thing is, is simply, this does not catch God by surprise. God calls all people to believe, but secondly, Jesus knows who will and won't believe. Look, it's right there in verse 64. But Jesus knew from the beginning who it was who would not believe. Verse 26, Jesus knew they weren't after him for the true bread. They were after him just for the bread that he was giving them, the physical bread. Back in chapter 2, verse 24, but Jesus on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. So Jesus knows all of this. So whosoever will may come, that's the first thing you need to understand. Two, Jesus knows who will and won't come. And three, those who do come have been given life by the Father. They've been given faith by the Father. And this is made more clear in John chapter 1. Listen to John chapter 1, verse 13. In the introduction, he says, who were bo- or excuse me, verse 12, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of will of flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. It's simple, really. God is our Father. Anytime you see someone walking around, you know that person had a father. I remember where I was. My father, who was a pastor, who loved to make jokes, said to me, we're going through a drive-thru in the back of the car. He said, you know, Stephen, statistics show that if you have parents, there's a 100% chance that you, that your parents had parents themselves. And it took me about 30 minutes thinking about that in the car to realize he was just messing with me. And of course, I've done the right thing and done that to my son as well. Let him think about that. Anybody who's live has a father. Not shocking, is it? It's no different in spiritual life. If you have in spiritual life, it is because God gave you that life. And if it were in the mind of the Pharisees that they could work their way to God, and if it were in the mind of the people around them that they could somehow have Jesus as their servant king who's going to simply just give them all the physical bread they want and they're going to be fine, Jesus said to them, I want to address a major truth. The only life you have is through my torn flesh and blood. You have life through my death. 
If that's offensive, you have to understand that the Holy Spirit isn't on this as well. You can't have life unless he gives us that life. And that life is accessed through a father who gives us the faith to believe. Any pretense that we are something is, is smashed, destroyed, shattered in the light of this glorious truth. Well, here's how this chapter ends let's read the conclusion of it Jesus is teaching these through things that life comes through the spirit faith comes through the father look at verse 66 after this many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him of course profoundly offensive no surprise there ironic the word disciple means follower so his followers no longer followed him so Jesus said to the 12 do you want to go away as well Simon Peter answered him Lord to whom shall we go you have the words of eternal life, and we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and yet one of you is a devil? He spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he, one of the twelve, was going to betray him. So, when this passage ends, you have, first of all, these thousands following him, and at the very end, you have twelve. You say Jesus is profoundly then unsuccessful. <laughs> Why did he go from having these thousands of followers to now he just has 12 followers? No one looked at that and said, Jesus, you've done an incredible job. He experienced what we might call reverse church growth. He went in the opposite direction that you would want to go. But I want you to think with me for a minute about the effect that this has. In that moment, John was there. John, whom we're reading, is going to write this Gospel of John. He's going to write 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and, and he's going to write the book of Revelation. Peter is there. 1st and 2nd and 3rd, or 1st and 2nd Peter, rather. Mark is there. Matthew is there. He's going to write Gospels. From their witness, Stephen is going to become a believer, one of the early deacons of the church. From his martyrdom, Paul is going to become a believer, who writes the bulk of the New Testament. And from these 12 that are left, the whole world changes. And so when Peter finally says, representing the 12, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He's finally accomplished the purpose of all his teaching to begin with. It's like when they're in the boat and they're following Jesus and finally, mysteriously, they arrive. Jesus essentially says, you have arrived in this moment. You have the reason for which I have, I've taught you. And even still, Jesus speaks this sobering word that one of you is going to betray me. Now, this is a hard passage of Scripture. One of the reasons that we preach through books of the Bible is so that we won't skip passages like this. You have to, you have to deal with it. And if I skip verses, you need to call me or email me and see, Pastor, you're suspect. Why did you skip those verses? Explain the hard verses to us. And say, well, pastor, isn't this discouraging that Jesus is so offensive? Not at all. You say, why? Well, because of this. Listen, out of Jesus giving these words, remember, he said, these are words of life. From these words of life came the faith of the apostles, and from the face of the apostles, faith of the apostles, the world was changed. And so Jesus was not afraid to offend the many for the faith of the few. Not for the sake of offense. It should be our ambition in the way we present ourselves in life and certainly as we present ourselves as a church in every possible way, we remove the offense, the, the barriers of people coming to faith in Christ from the parking lot to the pew to the city center to everything we're doing. Remove every possible barrier for people to come to Christ. Why? Well, because the gospel of Christ, gospel of Christ is offensive enough. And, and I don't look at this in a pessimistic way like isn't this depressing? The gospel is going to turn some people off because it will. Nor do I look at this in kind of a gleeful way, as some people do. I'm going to preach as hard as I can because I want to make you as mad as I possibly can. Uh, uh, that's a wrong ambition as well. How do you approach this as a church? We approach this with a joyful, hopeful optimism. Why? Well, because the same message that offended some was the seedbed of faith for others. And unless the gospel goes out, that faith can never take root. And so what a glorious thing 
that our D groups, our smallest expression of Bible studies, we're reading the word of God and talking about it together because the spirit brings life through the word and it's gonna take root. In our Sunday school classes, in our groups, we teach the word of God. Why? Well, because there the spirit is gonna take root in hearts and bear fruit. And from the pulpit, we take time to simply explain the word of God because for every someone who is offended, there'll be someone who says, the spirit has awakened this inside of me and I want more. There will be some who cannot stomach the gospel and there will be some who cannot get enough truth. But you never know which is which until you preach the gospel. So we unashamedly full-throatedly remove any offense we can personally because we want to make the gospel clear because true believers will bear fruit this last week I sat down with someone who was grappling with the faith and so I just opened the Bible and began to read to them and I went down to our new resource center down here because uh, this person didn't have a Bible and I just Open up the Bible and uh, we turn to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. And I said, why don't you just read that to me? And so they begin to read it to me. And uh, as they did, they got choked up. They teared up. And what was happening? Well, what was happening is not just an emotional response was that the Spirit was giving this person life. Not in myself, not because they were excited about joining a new church or joining a new faith, but because the Holy Spirit of God, that the Word of God was quickening something in them to new life. And what an incredible thrill to see. I can't produce that new life. They can't produce that new life. Only God can produce that new life. And God gave His Son. His Son came down and taught, went back to heaven. And the life, the way we access that life is that we are led to the person of Jesus through His Word. And that Word is revealed to us in our Scriptures. And so, it's in the scriptures that any pretense that I could come to God alone is demantled, dismantled. I gain life through the broken body of Jesus. It is the Spirit who gives life and is the Father who gives faith. And in that, we praise Him and we give Him all the glory. So, as we go to our groups in prayer, the effect that this should have on us this morning is very simple. The effect that it should have on us is awe, worship, and praise. Jesus, thank you for your shed blood that gives me life. Spirit, thank you that you give us life. And Father, thank you that you give us the faith to be able to believe in you. We worship you. 